It is a pleasure, as always, to be worshiping with you today. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea. A great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in him he stands, no tongue can bid me dance depart. No tongue.
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. You guys are awake and ready. As the uh, children get up and go back to their time of worship and service, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. All right. An odd, an odd, not an odd passage. It's not odd because it's here in Scripture. But uh, as I was thinking about it, it's like, does this, does this happen today in, in church, in our church, in, in the church in general? I'm sure it does, but I was thinking back to our, the history. We've been here since like 1974. Is that right? Mom, Dad, we were moved up here from, and, you know, off and on for the last, that's a lot of years. Um, we've been associated with this church, like, and I, I don't remember ever, ever a case where this kind of the scripture applies. But it doesn't mean it would never. And so, as we go through scripture and we read this in in context, maybe I'm I'm praying maybe that one of you, somebody here, is maybe thinking about this or going through this, or it, perhaps it could be a possibility, and it, it helps us remember. How we are to to act in this, this situation, and, and with that, you know, this, this, this the whole thing in general in Corinthians is like it reminds me of a of a passage or a scripture that Paul says. I'm not going to remember where it came from. You can yell that out if you remember. But he says that we need to walk in a manner worthy of the call. All the time, right? Not when we want to, when it's easy, but our life, we, we walk in a manner of the worthy that we've been called by Jesus Christ. And the reason is that in, in the little description or the, the introduction is that Christ died on the cross in order that our sins would be completely washed away and that we would become new creations and new citizens of an eternal kingdom. Paul reminds us of how we, we the church, us, is to live until Christ returns for his bride. And this, these passages is, is reminding not only the, the church in Corinth, but for us today, 2022, how we are to live each and every day in view of a world that is watching us. So let's pray as we, we look at this and uh, ask God to, to challenge us. Father, you are so good. 
And Lord, we have the privilege now to, to read this passage. Lord, we have your spirit that is active and moving and is going to speak clearly to us today. Lord, help me to speak clearly. Lord, that the word that is, that is read is clear. The words that have been written down are clear. And Father, we can walk away today with not only a better understanding of who you are and how you want us to live, but motivated to put this into practice in our lives the moment we stand up and, and leave today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go through, I want you to write these. It's not on there. Um, write these four things, these questions as we go through this. Not only, I think, today, but as we go through the rest of Corinthians, reminding ourselves, the first thing, who are we? Who are we? Who are you? You know, you ever, you ever go to a, a, a group meeting or a, a, a conference or something, and they sit down and they say, you know, just, just, uh, just tell us who you are. And people go, da 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 Especially, and it's, it's kind of worse than a Christian conference, and never, no one ever says, like, well, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. How many times do you say that right off the bat? We, we, we describe our earthly person, our credentials, and why we're here, and our background and stories. But when you describe yourself, who are we? Do you ever start off with the fact, I'm a born-again Christian by the grace of God? So who are we? To whom do we belong? Who do you belong to? If you're at a marriage conference, I belong to this person right here. That's why we're here. All right, so, you know, we, we identify with other things. To whom do we belong? To what do we belong? What are you a part of? What, what kingdom are you a, truly a part of? Finally, whom do we individually and collectively, who do we represent? Every single day. I think those questions, is, Paul kind of answers these and reminds us of these things all the way through this book of 1 Corinthians, because obviously there was an issue. So let's read this passage in chapter 6, verses 1 through 11, then we'll look at it a little closer. It says, One of you has a grievance against another. Does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is judged or to be judged by you... Are you incompetent to, tr to trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to shame, to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the revilers, nor the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11 is such a great verse. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Yes, amen. So as you read this, I mean, just for the first time, do you get the idea that, that maybe Paul is, is associating going to court against a brother as part of that law list of, of naughtiness? It shouldn't be, should it? It's in the same context, right? He's associating that with the things that we deem really, really bad. And Paul is kind of saying, well, what you're doing is really, really bad. 
So we have this section about law and going to court sandwiched between what Pastor Duba preached in chapter 5 and when he gets to preach again next week. He's like two, two doses of this nastiness, right? And so why do we have this, this little, little separation talking about going to court? And the problem is, I think, as, as the earth, as the earth, as the world creeps into the church and we begin to compromise in these worldly things, these become items of, 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 of dissent and things we take to court, and people see that. So not only are we doing these things in private that shouldn't be done and, and into the church, but now they're being brought forth into the courts. And, and this may or may not be the, the case here that what, what Pastor Duber preached on chapter 5 about the, the incest going on, that this may be the, the, the topic of discussion in the local court the next day. And think about the damage that does to the name of God. Not only have Christians doing these things, but now they're bringing these things to public and they're airing out their dirty laundry in front of the city of Corinth for everyone to see. And that does nothing to glorify God. Or maybe like many things in life, we have a tendency to sweep them under the rug and we don't hold people accountable for their actions. And when we do that, we don't take care of it when it's first seen and we, we begin to cover it up. We know that it grows and grows and grows and grows. And what happens is soon it's, gonna, it's just going to blow up, isn't it? And when it blows up, it usually ends up in a state where everyone is watching and there's always collateral damage when that happens, isn't there? When things are left unseen and things are, are, are swept under the rug and, and then it comes to, to public view, we know there's damage across the board. And the worst part of that damage is the name of God being muddied along the way. That we can't have that. The name of Christ is muddled and muddied. So what Paul had a gripe was the fact that we should have been that this should have been kept internal, this idea that it should have been handled to begin with, and it should have been stopped where it didn't need to come to public view. And what happens when we, we don't do that is that we, we're not unified. You're taking brothers to court, that just causes divisions because you got this side over here, you guys all set together, and one brother over here takes a brother over here to court. Now you have a whole side against each other. And you guys are stuck in the middle, all right? But you have two parts of the church that, that are against because there, there's an affinity over here. There's an affinity over here. And they go to court. And of course, they're going to take sides. What does that do to the church? How does that glorify God when that happens? What does that do to the prayer that, that Jesus and that Jesus' desire? And in John 17, just a beautiful prayer before he is executed, before he is put to death on the cross, he is praying for you and I in this moment. That just blows my mind. That he was thinking about us and praying earnestly. I'm just going to read it. I'm not going to say much about it. Just read it and remind yourselves what Jesus prayed for. Verse 14, I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth, as you sent me into the world. So I have sent them, sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Then it's us. I do not ask for these only, these disciples that he was praying for there, but for also those who will believe in me through their word. That is us. That they may all be one. And we read that many times. He's saying that they all, all of us, not just here in this sanctuary, but the sanctuary across the street, the sanctuary in Milwaukee, the sanctuary in China, the sanctuary in Ukraine today, that we would all be one. The body of Christ, just as you, 
Father are in me and I in you, they, they also may be in us for the reason so that the world who is watching may believe that you have sent me. Why was Paul so upset and maybe angered to the point where he wished that he's glad he didn't show up in person because it would have been a lot worse. There would have been a smackdown. But he wrote them a letter. Because they were not walking in a manner worthy of the call. They forgot who they were. They forgot who they belonged to. What Jesus prayed for and died for was not being manifested in the Corinthian church. They were moving from just being in the world, which Jesus prayed for, and hated by the world. Maybe they began doing that, but they were becoming of the world and loved by the world. Do we want to be loved by the world or hated by the world? We want to be hated by the world because we're different. We're followers of Jesus Christ. And his standards are much different than the standards of the world. But sometimes, and I think the Corinthian church, and it doesn't change. I mean, church would realize that it's so much easier to exist if we just adopt a little bit. Compromise a little bit here, a little bit there. We can get more people in our pews. But we're here to be in the world. And as Jesus says, he gave us the word and the world hated us for that. Doesn't mean we stop being light. A little context before we move on, what's happening here. We think that in California, we have a love affair with litigation, don't we? Everybody loves to go to court. Usually to get money. There's always money made to have in court. Civil lawsuits are all over the place, and that way, if you win, you're going you're gonna to cash in. In Corinth, it was a way of life. It's what they did. I was surprising to hear some of the stuff. I mean, you know, it, it became like entertainment to them. It was something they did to, to watch. It was kind of like, you know, we see it on Facebook and Instagram. We see everyone airing out their dirty laundry there. And people debating and talking about it, right? That's what they did every day in, in Corinth. Except not on their phone, but in person. They were doing this. The dirty laundry was out there for everyone to see. And that everyone, and, being, and think about the, the tantalizing, sensationalizing of those stories. It's like us watching whatever TV show to get the name. You know, we just, we do that. We're kind of fascinated with that. But, and that's just the demise of society. But this is what happened there. A jury then consisted of at least 500 male citizens. 500 would go and watch and put their, you know, give their, their opinion on this. It could go up to as many as 1,500. And people were like, you know, people would wait around in, 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 the, in the commons and in, in the, the gate or wherever they would meet just to be picked. Hey, you get to go to court today. Come on. And they would want that. They woke up in the morning, went down to the city square, hoping that they would be picked to go to jury. We run and hide every time, Right? We make up all kinds of excuses not to go be on a jury. But they loved it. Because why? It's just like, just open view of whatever they would bring to court. There's no secrets. You got 1,500 people showing up for a jury. Your, your life was exposed. We thought O.J. Simpson, I mean, he had millions of people watching. He has no private life. These people, there was no private. So you see why Paul was upset, because things that should be settled in the church were being publicized to all of Corinth. And what if this was a matter in chapter 5? The father and son went to court over this, and this whole thing was brought forth to the city of Corinth. 1,500 jurors making a decision on this chapter 5. Didn't need to be. And unfortunately, this, this mindset was creeping into the church of Corinth because that's what we did before. Maybe they stopped for a while. 
but it was beginning to creep back in. And it's not that Paul had, you know, distrust in the Roman si- the system. He, he pleaded to it when he was in Jerusalem, didn't he? He believed in it for certain things, but not to take care of matters within the body of Christ. Where things that should be between us, and again, not swept under the rug, it gets placed on the world stage. And we know what happens with one post. You get grumpy with somebody at church and you post something on Facebook, what happens? The whole world knows. Did it need to be? No, it didn't need to be. So let's look at this. Why, why did Paul have such an issue with this? And the first one is just pretty blunt. Don't be a disgrace. It says, when, you, when one of you have a grievance, and that's just, it's a thing, it's a lawsuit. Um, that, that word grievance basically means lawsuit or a thing that you have against somebody else, a thing. So when you have a grievance against another, does he dare? Now, that word dare is important because it's like, it's just like there's no fear of doing it. You know, we've all gotten in trouble playing truth or dare before as a child, right? You did some pretty silly things because you were dared, and you just, without fear, you did it, and you didn't even think about it. The repercussions of you doing that. And that's the same attitude that's rushing into this. Do you dare? They didn't dread it. There's no, there no fear of it, but they were just doing this. Do you dare, he dare, go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? But you yourselves, verse 8, we're going to skip down. You yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. And we do this, and they were doing this on basically the world stage. And just some questions, a question here. So what keeps brothers and sisters in Christ from handling disputes among themselves? Why don't we go to our brother? Why don't we just walk up to our sister if there's an issue? Instead of harboring it or sweeping it under the rug or even worse, letting it fester to a point where we have to keep it or have to take it to court. And we know what happens when we cover up sin. It usually results in becoming a public matter, doesn't it? It's going to happen. Truth always comes out. And unfortunately, we live in a world that is watching us, and they can't wait for the church to fail. That's just juicy material for for TV, for news cycle. And not only is it juicy, they take it and they sensationalize it and make it even bigger than what it should have been. And again, we're not saying that we're to look the other way when it comes to these, these failures within our relationships we need to, to handle it and not pretend it's not there to the point where we have to go to court. We've got to think of it as Christ is our HR specialist. We, if you work in a big corporation, you have human resources, right? And they handle all the affairs of the internal relationships in the company, correct? And when you have an issue with your person, your fellow employee, where do you go? You go to HR, and they'll take care of it. Well, Christ, he's, he's given us, right? He is the expert, and he's given us a guide which we can follow step by step, hasn't he? In a way we can process and that we can be successful in reconciling between brothers and sisters in the church. And it's not rocket science, is it? And we're going to get to that next point. I mean, it, that we're all capable of doing that. And when we do this, because the last thing we want to do is hear from the world is that you're no different from the rest of us. We go to court, and this is what was happening. That was their lifestyle, and now the church was doing the same thing. You're, you're no different than us. What makes you Christian different than us pagan? You do this crazy things that chapter 5 and then you take it to court like we do so why do we need your Christ why do we need to be changed you're putting your hope in this world system you say you put your hope in Christ but you're not
What leads to our litigation frenzy is that we're preoccupied with our rights. We have a right to that. I deserve that. Instead of being preoccupied with our responsibility of walking in a manner worthy of the call. We focus on our earthly given rights. We have a piece of paper that says we have the rights, being given rights to do things. And sometimes we hold that up higher than our rights in God's kingdom. What responsibility do we have as, as Christ given us when it comes to our relationships? And it's pretty simple. We have a responsibility to love each other, don't we? Is that hard? It's easy to say. But we're to love one another. We're to show compassion to one another in the body of Christ. We're to have mercy on each other in the body of Christ. And we're to show grace and to forgive. If we would just focus on forgiveness, we wouldn't need any courts, would we? Just, I forgive you. Even though you hurt me, I forgive you. When we fail to do this, when we fail to take responsibility and to focus on that responsibility, we as the, the city on a hill, it reduces our brightness, doesn't it? Our lights grow dim. The light never goes out, does it? Christ will never be defeated. But collectively, the more that we are responsible and take responsibility for what we've been called to do in this world, in this kingdom, collectively, what does that do to the light that emanates from these, this building and our lives in the, in the community? It's unavoidable. I hear that church over there that is, they love and take care of one another. We see it. We hear about it. Your reputation is, is all over the place. Not only your love for one another, but your love for the community, your grace that you show, it is so evident. That's what we are to be known for. And sometimes this has caused the next point is we lose sight of our destiny. And Paul kind of shifts gears here and reminds them of who we are and what we will do one day. And what we, we can do even today, it says in verse 2 and 3, or do you not know, it's like the first of six times he says this, do you not know, like, come on now, you know this. Don't you remember who you are? Do you not know that the saints, now that's us, the saints, the saints as we live today. I'm going to, we're doing this today. We are redeemed today, aren't we? We have been purchased. We have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We belong to God, our Creator. That's a saint, isn't it? That's all of us in this room who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. With that, we've been given the Spirit of the living God. Paul tells in Ephesians chapter, chapter 1, we have been given every spiritual blessing. He held nothing back. He gave us everything we need to walk in a manner worthy of the call. That same Spirit teaches us all we need to know how to do that. And that involves our relationships. We have everything we need to live in relationship with one another and what to do and what not to do. The problem is we just don't do it. We have the knowledge, we just don't practice it. We have access to the God who gives us the wisdom when we ask it. He will says, if you ask it, I will give it. And he says, you better be ready because when I give it, you better use it. He doesn't hold that back. And so we as saints today, do we have the tools needed to handle our disputes among us? Are we lacking anything? There's nothing. We lack nothing. Then he goes on like even bigger things, right? And, then he, and this is where, you know, we, we could spend a lot of time talking about these, this next two verses, but we're not going to. Does that make sense? Just take it for what it is right here, okay? That we will judge the world. When are we going to do that? 
That's debate. You can talk all day back and forth about this. We're not going to do that right now. <laughs> the world is to be judged by you. Are you incompetent to try and try? And he's like, he's got to be in snarky here. Are you incompetent? You're not. He's, you're not incompetent. We just went over. He's given you everything you need to try these trivial things that are popping up in our, our congregations. Then he says, do you not know that you are to judge angels? So if you can judge the world one day, and if you're going to judge angels one day, and you've been equipped with everything you need, how much more then matters pertaining to the life today? Can we handle the disputes between us? And I, I, I'm, I'm not, well, I am speaking, I, I don't think we, do you have any disputes that people like, like just hardcore? No. So when I, when I was preparing for this, I was like, gosh, don't come up with something so this applies. I don't want you to do that. But, but it may. It may happen tomorrow. It may happen three weeks from now. It may happen a year from now. But remember who you are and what you've been given to handle the dispute we have within the body of Christ. We don't need to take it anywhere. All right, real quick. Judge of the world, I got you. Judges of, of angels. Um, Matthew Henry says this. Shall Christians have the honor to sit with the sovereign judge at the last day? That's what he's talking about. Whilst he passes judgment on sinful men and evil angels. And are they not worthy to judge of the trifles which you contend before heathen magistrates? That's Matthew's, Henry's take on this, this passage. We're, gonna, we're heirs with Christ. He's sitting on, he will sit on a throne. He's sitting on a throne. We will be there on a throne with him as he passes judgment. There's verses, there's only three really references about this. Matthew 19, 28 says, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world. And what is the new world? If you look at that, that, those two words together, it's the signal and glorious change of all things for the better. The restoration of the primal and perfect condition of things which existed before the fall of our first parents, which the Jews looked for in the connection with the advent of the Messiah, and which we Christians expected in connection with the visible return of Jesus from heaven. When he comes back for us, a new world is going to be created, isn't it? It's at that time. When the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you have followed me, will also sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. One more, two more, I'll just read one more. Revelation 3, 21, the one who conquers, that's us, we conquer through Jesus Christ, we are more than conquerors, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my Father on his throne. We have that position in Christ. Think of it like that. We have that position. Not because of our own doing, but because it is through Christ that we are conquerors, more than conquerors. If you want another one, you can read Daniel 7, 9 through 10. And it all talks about that last day. The ancient of days, as we sung about. What happens when we make that mistake by taking someone to court? Verses 4 through 7. And the point is, you know, even though we think we win, it's really a defeat. Defeat can look like a win. So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? Why do you take it there? Because they don't have the godly wisdom that you have. Do we understand that? We're, we're taking something of Christ, uh, a situation in the body of Christ to somebody who doesn't even believe in God. What do they know about our situation? How can they handle it? I say this to your shame. He's like, he's, he hits him pretty hard here. It's, you're doing this. It's your shame. You're, you're causing shame on you and you're shaming the name of God. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle the dispute between the brothers? Is there anyone here? 
hundred and something people here. Is there just one of us who can sell a dispute? If Josh and I had a dispute, is there just one of you who could step into our lives and help us out? Do you have to rely upon an elder to do that? Or can't, do you have the qualifications to do that yourself? Paul says you do. Because one day you're going to judge the world with Christ and you can judge angels. And right now you have the power of the Spirit of the living God in you to help you to make that judgment or settle that dispute. Is there no one? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? And that's just pride, isn't it? We don't like to be wrong. We don't like being defrauded. We don't like being whatever the case is because of our pride. We, we like to win. We like to be proven right. And sometimes you just have to, to swallow that Lay that pride down at the feet of the cross and for the sake of the unity of the body of Christ. But that's hard, isn't it? It's hard to do that. Without Christ, it is impossible to do that. But we have Christ. We have the Spirit of God living inside of us. And you think about, what, is a, what does a worldly lawyer have against even... I guess we call ourselves the least of us. He has nothing. He doesn't have the Spirit of God to help him dis with discernment, does he? We do. We have that wisdom. We live in a watching world. And all of our pride, greed, and desire is it to be proven right you may win the lawsuit, but in reality, you're going to lose because you've shown that we can't, we can't handle each other's issues here, right here. Makes God that kind of weak, doesn't it? When you go outside of that. I think because of this, like what I, I, I mentioned those four questions at the beginning, we have forgotten our identity. It's just, it just, just, we can't forget that. So now we're going to go and just talk through Matthew 5 through 7. You ready? <laughs> read that. The instructions for kingdom living. When was the last time you read the Sermon on the Mount? It tells us how to live. It tells us how to walk in a manner worthy of the call. It teaches, Christ teaches us how we are to rate, relate with one another. And I think the Corinthians forgot that. I'm sure when Paul was there, he, he was preaching on the Old Testament and on the life of Christ. And you got to know the Sermon on the Mount came up when he was planting these churches. This is how you, you are to live, church. These are the guidelines. This is the human resource handbook right here, chapters 5 through 7 of Matthew, how we are to relate with one another until Christ comes back. We need to remind ourselves of who we are and how we should live. And when he preached that Sermon on the Mount, it just wasn't for the 12 disciples, right? It was everyone who was listening and who would soon or maybe give their life and follow Jesus Christ. This is how you live. This is how you relate to one another. This is how you take care of one another. This is how you humble yourself. This is how the acts of marriage and, and all the things that Jesus addresses there is right there in those two, three chapters. We've got to remember that we, we as a church belong to a brand new society. It's now. The kingdom of God is now as far as the spiritual kingdom. It is, it is living today. And we are citizens of that kingdom. We are citizens of God's kingdom. And this kingdom is in this world, and we are living in this world today. And we can't forget the rules of God's kingdom. We can't forget what it means and how we are to walk each and every day. We must settle within the church on the matters that pertain to our kingdom family, just like the way we would settle within our earthly family. And I realize there's families that take each other to court, and that's just, it's sad, isn't it? 
And it should be sad if you ever thought about having to take a fellow brother or sister to, to, to court. Because we are one. We have a same goal. And Jesus gave the instruction. I'm just going to read through Matthew 18 to refresh your minds on how we are to handle such things. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Don't go anywhere else. Don't tell anybody else. Go directly to your brother or sister and tell them of the fault that there is between you and him. Alone, that's it. No one else needs to know. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. You're done. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, to those two people, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. You kind of just, you got to dismiss him. <laughs> Reminds me, growing up swimming, we, we'd go on trips. And our coach would say this to us before we left. If you embarrass me, you embarrass the swim team, you're going home. That's it. You're not going to disgrace us. And so I, I listened to that all my life, you know, growing swimming for all those years. And then finally, I, I was a coach, and I, and I took a group of 80 swimmers to Seattle, and that was my spill. If you embarrass me, are the team, you're going home. And lo and behold, young man stole some money out of a cash register, tried to. Take him to the airport. doesn't matter what flight's available. Parents are paying for it. And we send him home. First class, that's it. You're going first class, buddy, but your parents are paying for it. Because you're not, God, we, Paul was, he was, he was upset because the, the church was disgracing the name of God. And we shouldn't be in the business of disgracing the name of God. Luke 17, 3 through 4, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. That's an act. We got to have that forgiveness in there. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, what do you do? And returns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Will that solve a lot of issues in our church? I think so. We are the redeemed people, verses 9 through 11. We are redeemed. I'm going to read this one more time. And as I read this, just keep this point in mind. Paul isn't giving us a list of sins that may cause us to lose our salvation. There are no such sins. He's reminding us of how we once lived, and now we don't have to live that way anymore. Okay? Or do you not know, again, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? those who continually, purposely live this way. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. He's just given us a catalog of sinners typical of the unsaved. People who, who wake up in the morning and that's what they do. They plan to do these things. That's their character. When people mention their name, oh, that's that person over there. Those are the unrighteous. Those are those who won't inherit the kingdom of God. We are not the unsaved. That's what Paul's reminding them. You are not the unsaved. And I think we conclude, you are not, and again, it's not an issue. It's not a prolific issue in this church. Maybe in larger churches that have four or five, six thousand people, it probably is an issue because you have a bigger gene pool. But here, I just don't see it, but it doesn't mean it could ever happen. But it, it translates to how we live our life in general. We are not the unsaved. We are washed 
three words here. First one is washed. We have a new life in Christ. We are a new creation. All these old things that we used to do, live for, desire for, they're gone. They are passed away. You don't, you're not bound by those anymore. Your past is, is, is not shackled to your ankle anymore. It is, it is gone. The shame you experience in your past is just blown up. And you don't have to live in that shame and that sin anymore. You are washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. And after that, <clears throat> once we're washed clean, we are the workmanship of Christ, right? Newly created in Christ himself. Basically, we're born again, aren't we? We're born again anew. A new life in Christ. A new standing in Christ. A new inheritance with Christ. We once inherited what? Death. The wrath of God. Now we inherited, inherit the, the riches of, of heaven with God, with Christ. We're sanctified. We are constantly being set apart. Now we're all in different parts, right? And again, the only way that we can truly sanctify ourselves is what? Is, is washing our mind in the word of God. We have to wash it. Not just once a month. Not just once a week. Unless you're from, well, I won't go, no. Um, <laughs> every single day, we have to wash your mind to be sanctified, to be set apart. We have a new standard of behavior that has been programmed into our, to being born again. We have, we have a born again DNA. A DNA that pursues Christ, a DNA that desires God, a DNA that wants to please God over men, a DNA that does not want to go back to the things that were listed, a DNA that wants to do what is right in the, light, in the sight of God. He has rewired us. He has changed your DNA to do that, to live righteously, to do what is right in the eyes of God. We now have the capacity to to walk in a manner that pleases God. Before Christ, you didn't have the capacity. You didn't even have the desire to do that. But now you do. Justified. We have a new standing before God. We are now clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And when God looks at us, he doesn't see the old anymore. He doesn't see that list of just like, ugh, that stuff that just like makes, no. He doesn't see that anymore. What does he see? He sees the blood of Christ. When God looks at us, he doesn't see the old. He sees his son's righteousness. He doesn't see your sins, and he doesn't see your past. So by the blood of Christ, we are redeemed to walk this new life anew whether it be chapter 5, chapter 6, 9 through 11, what Pastor Duke is going to preach about next week in verses 12 through the end. We don't, we're not bound to that anymore. That's the beauty of our life and being redeemed in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, you are good. You are gracious. You are patient. Thank you for the blood of Christ. Thank you for the faith that you offer by your grace to believe and have our eyes opened to the fact that we need salvation. We need forgiveness. And you, off, you offered that. You've given that through Christ. Lord, we thank you for that. And we love you. Amen. Let's all stand together and sing a closing song. Um, if you'd like to come up and pray with myself or Pastor Duba, we will be up front here. But let's just rejoice in the fact that we are redeemed.
don't you pray with me? God, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can stand here redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Uh, Lord, I pray that this message would ring true in our hearts, uh, that those that are still searching would find you, Lord, that they would be softened, and that they would submit themselves to you. And God, I pray for this afternoon as we gather together to continue our, uh, our day of excitement, of celebration, and, uh, and uh, we would love each other, we'd care for one another, that we would make new friendships and uh, bolster old ones. And Father, I just uh, I ask that you would help us to stand apart in this world, um, to, uh, to be different, to look different, to sound different, and to draw people in uh, because of that. Uh, Lord, that you... Uh, that your word, your gospel, the truth would, uh, would be heard by many um, and uh, that it would, it would transform their hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen.